It's UMass Week here at Locked On Boston College, and on today's show, Michael Trainey of Fight Massachusetts stops by to give us all we need to know about the UMass Minutemen. All of that and more on today's Locked On Boston College. You are Locked On Boston College, your daily podcast on the Boston College Eagles, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. This is Locked On Boston College. AJ Black here. I am the editor and publisher of bcbulletin.com. Check out my work there. On today's show, we're kicking it off. It's time to talk, start talking about the Battle of the Bay State. UMass and Boston College battling it out at McGuirk Stadium on Saturday at noon. A game that can be found on SM Plus or whatever the heck Flow Sports is. I guess, I guess if you're outside of New England, that's where you're going to find it. So Boston College and UMass, we'll talk about that in just a moment. But let's kick it off with news. There's a lot of news to talk about. First of all, ACC football news came out this week that Boston College wide receiver Zay Flowers, who had seven catches for 135 yards and a touchdown, was named ACC Receiver of the Week. Well-deserved. He had an incredible game and really showcased what we've been talking about here on this podcast for for the entire winter. He just looked dy- dynamic. I mean, Colgate couldn't stop him. And if, if Phil Dracovic wanted to keep throwing the ball all game, he could have. Uh, but, you know, great game for Zay Flowers. And speaking of Dracovic, he was the co-quarterback of the uh, week. A lot, he shared that honor with Brennan Armstrong of Virginia. Now, Dracovic threw for 275-plus yards. He had three touchdowns. He had a nice long 43-yard run to go along with it. Showcased all the things that you hope from Dracovic. Tough, good decision-making, great game for him. So two good um, awards for BC. Now, if this was a game against anyone else, I would have liked to have seen the offensive line get some some love, too. I mean, against pass protection, they were incredible. But they didn't, so that's okay. But So two uh, ACC Player of the Week awards already for Boston College. Secondly, we're going to move on to basketball recruiting. And this is probably the biggest news basketball has hit since the announcement of the new practice facility. Donald Han Jr., a four-star combo guard from Virginia Beach, announced that he is committed to Boston College. Now, if you had been following BC Bullets and Premium, cheap plug, we talked about him committing two days ago, you would know all about this um, this kid. He is a top 100 recruit, four stars. He is an elite recruit for, in terms of Boston College. Uh, he had offers from NC State, Clemson, um, Georgia Tech, Maryland. So big programs wanted him, and he chose Boston College. Now, this was incredible, too, for a number of reasons. Because, you know, when Boston College landed, I think it was his top six a couple of weeks ago, Hand um, I was very heavy towards NC State. I thought, you know, the the, the tea leaves were saying, you know, this kid's going to commit to NC State. He's going to end up being in the Wolfpack. Didn't happen, though. He ends up visiting Boston College this weekend, had a great time there. And, you know, what ended up happening is that that telltale sign when you're when you're following recruiting, right? He visits and then comes back and immediately says, I'm going to announce where I'm committing to. That should always be a tell that he's going to commit to the school he just visited. That's usually what happens. Like, wow, I love that school. And guess what? You know, this is one of those program changing commitments for Earl Grant. Like he got some nice guys like Jaden Zachary. I've heard great things about him and uh, some of the, uh, you know, Dexter McLaughlin, Dexter McLaughlin, uh, Glockton, excuse me, you know, good players. This is a, a program changing commitment, right? You're getting a elite blue chip. I don't want to say blue chip, but elite recruit for Boston College. Basketball, that it happens here and there. You know, Gianni Thompson was right around there. And, um, and DeMar Langford was, you know, around there too. But you wanted to see this jump right out with new head coach Earl Grant, and he did it right off the bat. And now when I said Thompson and I saw DeMar, DeMar Langford, you know, those guys were local. Grant is already hitting outside of the the normal catch catch area. He's hitting Virginia now. Christian he had his North Carolina guys right. You know, um, Jerome Robinson, um, Kai Bowman. These guys were all these North Carolina guys. Maybe Virginia will be where Earl Grant gets his bones. So good start. 
I'm not a, I'm not there to say that Donald Hand is going to immediately turn Boston College basketball into a contender. He's coming in the class of 2022. It's going to be another year. But this is the first commitment for that class, so this is a way, great way to start that off. Now, if you build around that, you get another big, uh, like a big to go with that, maybe a center or a, a, a wing or a forward to go along. Then we're talking. If you get another four-star to go with this, but you need to build from this. And you have to start with baby steps with Earl Grant. You can't immediately think a head coach is going to take Boston College basketball and bring them up to tournament level in, in the snap of your fingers. It just doesn't happen that way. And this... You know, you get your you get your practice facility. You get excellent recruiters as your assistant coaches. I, BC's got really good assistants. I like who they got. Uh, and then you add in your first blue chip. Now maybe you add a transfer and you get a couple more recruits. All of a sudden you're talking because you add now a guard to go with Demar Langford to go with Gianni Thompson and some of these other kids that may, you will have to see how they flush out. And all of a sudden you're saying, okay, you know this program's heading in the right direction. Of course, we're going to have to see how Earl Grant does on the on the court. How does he how does he coach? How is his program going to look? How prepared are his guys going to be? Is he going to be as gritty as he says he's going to be? Because that will be where we get our answer about where Boston College is going to be. But hey, for today, Donald Hand Jr. is a massive get for Boston College. It is a good sign for BC basketball that they're heading in the right direction. Now we'll have to see who's next. Now Chaz Kelly is another one to watch. He's not a blue chipper, but he's a kid that got a lot of attention. And um, Justin Fernandez, if you're looking for a BC to add that next elite guard, Justin Fernandez is that guy. Uh, he's got a ton of offers, though. So these are two guys to watch for. See where BC goes with it. Uh, in a moment, we're going to be joined by Michael Trainey of Fight Massachusetts. But before we do that, I want to tell you about the NFL season, about which is about to begin, and nobody covers it like Locked On Podcast Network. August 30th through September 8th, Locked On's Ultimate Season Preview is taking you through every team and every division with the help of Odyssey's Ross Tucker and Jason Lacana Forer. Follow the Ultimate Season Preview 2021 feed on the Odyssey app wherever you get your podcasts. Tune in, beginning August 30th. It's that time of year again, and all eyes are turning to football as teams are back on the gridiron to start the football season. As always, Bet Online is your number one spot for all the pro and college football action this season. Get all the updated odds, props, and contests, including online's biggest half million dollar NFL mega contest and the world's largest two hundred thousand dollar NFL survivor contest. Open now at Bet Online. Head over to the website or use your mobile device to sign up today to receive your hundred percent welcome bonus. And be sure to take advantage of their opening day super promo. Make a bet on the September 9th game season opener between the Super Bowl champion Buccaneers and Cowboys. If you lose, you'll be refunded up to $25 for new customers only using promo code NFL100. Bet online is the fastest and easiest way to bet on all your sports action. From football, basketball, boxing, right to your favorite Vegas casino games, don't wait and take advantage of all the great offers available for the 2021 season. Bet online, your online sportsbook experts. Did you know 85% of people who've played fantasy, fantasy daily sports lose? It's really that surprising? The game is rigged against you. You're playing against thousands of other lineups, not to mention experts who have more tools and more time. You do not stand a chance. Introducing Stat Hero. It's the first ever daily fantasy sports book that puts the player in control and winning within reach. Here's how it works. Stat Hero shows you their lineups and dares you to beat them. It's you versus the house in a head-to-head -head matchup. If you head on over to StatHero.com right now and use promo code Locked On, you can sign up for free. And right now, you can get three times back on your first play. They're giving you a 300% match. That's unheard of. Go to StatHero.com slash Locked On. That's StatHero.com slash Locked On. This is Locked On Boston College. With me, I have Michael Trainey of Fight Massachusetts, part of the 247 Network. He's going to talk to us today a little bit about UMass, who Boston College is playing at McGuirk Stadium on Saturday. Michael, how's it going? It's going well, AJ. Thanks for having me on, man. I appreciate it. Of course. This is the Battle of the Commonwealth. Uh, you know, Boston College may be ducking UMass in basketball, but we're going to play again in, in football. And this is the first time Boston College has played in Amherst, I think since the 80s. Um, uh, 1982, yeah. Doug Flutie, I think, was the QB at the time. Yep. And, you know, BC and UMass, we've had a, a bunch of games at um, Gillette, which honestly I have to say is one of my favorite uh, events because I love going to Gillette for football games. I think it's great. Um, and then some games in the alumni scene, but now it's back on campus. Can you talk a little bit about the changes they made to McGuirk to, you know, get them up to speed and get them up to, you know, FBS level? Yeah. I mean, initially when uh, UMass moved up, 
Uh, with the Mac, they had to replace the press box. Uh, the press box was uh, dilapidated pretty bad at the time. So they have a nice press box, skybox complex now. They also put in the football performance center, which BC fans will see at one end of the stadium. Um, for practice facility, locker room, all UMass stuff is in there. Um, in the last couple of years, they've put a nice new permanent scoreboard at the other end of the stadium, which you'll see. And you'll also see uh, the new practice facility. It's an indoor bubble um, that is just next to the stadium as well. So they have put a lot into fixing up the stadium itself. I mean, it's 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 no bargain. Don't get me wrong. It's still only 17,000 seats and, and, and everything, and it could use some work. But uh, the biggest improvement is they put in permanent bathrooms, which they haven't had for a long, you know, forever, really. So now they have those as well. So at least it uh, it's at FBS standards in that sense. And – you know, I, I say it on this podcast all the time. I, you know, I, you and I know that UMass fans, they have a special hatred of me and I, I get it. <laughs> I, I do my job and, I, and I, I, can, I can set them off a little bit. But I have to, I've been saying this all along this, this, this summer, that for UMass fans and for the UMass football program, Saturday's game is their Super Bowl. What is, you know, this is a big deal for the Minutemen, I'm assuming, to, to play against BC and to play them at home. The atmosphere is going to be electric, I assume. You know, what's the, what's the, uh, the feel about this game amongst the program, you know, fans, coaches, whatever? I mean, it's, it's definitely a big game. I mean, Super Bowl might be a bit of a stretch just because, you know, the way UMass is set up this year is it's, they're not going to be incredibly competitive in this game. I wouldn't say. I'm sure we'll get to that in a little bit. But it's it's a big game. Anytime UMass plays Boston College, especially from the UMass side, it's very big for the fans. They they love they love to hate BC, and, and that's just yep. how it goes. And the fact that it's been 40 years since BC's been to Amherst to play a game, you know, that, that uh, adds to it. Uh, you know, you haven't seen a game on campus in over two years because of COVID and everything like that. So it should be a big deal. I don't know what the turnout's going to be. Hopefully, it'll be a pretty good one. Um, you know, I'm sure the students will be there. First tailgate in two years as well, so the students will be very excited for that. But it's going to be exciting for the fans. You know, the fans want to see it. The fans want to see sort of a rivalry game, a heated contest. But I think anyone sensibly looking at the game knows that it's not going to be totally competitive. I mean, BC should win pretty easily, given where UMass and BC are in their respective developments as programs. Right. And, you know... Speaking of development, you know, I, I was impressed with UMass's uh, hire when they hired Walt Bell. They got him out of Florida State. You know, Mark Mark Whipple had his time there. He did what he was supposed to do. He, you know, he tried. I, I thought he was a good offensive mind. Now he's at Pitt. Um, you know, Walt Bell, I think, is a is a the the right hire for UMass. Um, what have you seen so far uh, in terms of his recruiting, the way he's building a program in Amherst? I mean, it's a slow build for sure. He started off with very little. Uh, you know, the cupboard was bare when he came in for 2019. Whipple didn't really leave much there in terms of talent, in terms of players, in terms of commits, really anything. It was it was a bit of a shambled situation. So it's definitely a long rebuild. So he went young with his first recruiting class, mostly high school kids, to try to build a base. 2020, there was a little bit more of a mix for recruiting with high school players and some JUCO transfers. This last recruiting cycle, BC fans are going to see a lot of transfers that came out of the portal for UMass. Uh, Power five transfers, grad transfers, things like that in some key positions. So they're trying to add more immediate talent for this year because they're looking to try to start to win some games. The, the recruiting hasn't been too bad. He's got a lot of inroads for schools, you know, in the DMV area because he worked at Maryland and, and there's a lot of talent there. He's got some inroads in Georgia. Uh, he's he, he seems to like Georgia athletes quite a bit. Um, they set up basically what what Bell set up was a. Uh, kind of a within six hour drive type of footprint for UMass that that's where they want to do most of their recruiting. Anything that's, you know, got a direct flight to Bradley in Connecticut, which is, you know, the airport UMass uses or anyone who can drive to the campus within six, maybe eight hours. So that's going to encompass the DMV, Pennsylvania, Jersey, New York, and obviously New England. So that's where they're doing most of their work, but then they'll go down to Georgia for some players or they'll go to the Juco road out in Kansas or anything like that. So they're, they're doing fairly well in that regard. I mean, not quite the same as a school like Boston College is doing with the way their recruiting is going, which seems to be off the charts with Jeff Halfley there now. Um, but they're slowly building up that talent base. They're still very young in Amherst, but they've they've got a lot more talent than they had before. And, you know, ideally down the line here this year, next year, the year after is when it's going to start to really stack up and help them continue to develop. 
And, you know, speaking of transfers, the the starting quarterback, Tyler Lytle, he's a transfer from Colorado. Um, you know, he had his first game against Pitt, and, you know, he pit, he threw for um, 167 yards, only 45% of his passes were complete, no touchdowns, no interceptions. What did you think of him in his first outing? I know Pitt, you know, as an ACC fan, I, I, I talked about this all offseason. They have a defense that, that is ruthless. Um, what did you think of how Lytle showed? I, and I apologize if I'm screwing his name up, but. How how did you think he looked? Uh, no, I mean that that Lytle's it, Tyler Lytle. He he looked uh, about as well as I would have expected. I mean, it was the first game for UMass. It was a little bit shaky, you know. Uh, unfortunately, his receivers dropped a few balls on him that would have helped his numbers. He also had a couple couple handful of overthrows, missed throws that really would have helped as well. So he was th- he was dinged up a little bit in camp and missed maybe a week or so, a week plus. So there's uh, probably still trying to get back into the rhythm with everybody and everything like that. He looked not bad. He looked the part, which is, I think, the biggest thing for UMass because the last two years, they really didn't have anyone who looked the part as an FBS quarterback. So now they have someone who, while he wasn't a starter at Colorado, he was a highly rated recruit. He was always competing to start. In fact, he may have been the starter last year, but I believe he got COVID and, and had to sit and then lost the starting job for the Buffaloes. So he's He's definitely someone who should continue to get better over the course of this season, and hopefully, you know, he'll be a little bit better against Boston College. But like you say, Pittsburgh defense was – they were malicious in that game. I mean, the front seven is, is brutal. UMass's offensive line, which was a real pro, – like a pain point for them last year, they weren't very good against Pitt. I mean, Pitt's defense – is very hard to block. One of the best in the conference, I would say. It might be the best, yep. arguably, with with Boston Colleges that um, UMass is going to see this whole year. So there was a lot to work through there. And, you know, obviously the offensive line is going to need to be better to give Lytle more time. Lytle's going to have to hit some of his reads. Uh, his receivers are going to have to help him out. But I think over the course of this season, especially in the group of five games that UMass plays, they've got a couple FCS opponents. They've got UConn, New Mexico State. In those games, you hopefully want to see him show out. But he, he, looked, he looked okay, not great, not terrible. And hopefully he continues to get better. Now, when I was previewing Boston College's season this year, the, and it was very evident when they played Colgate, my, the big question I, I, I posed uh, for a team playing them is, how are they going to stop Zay Flowers? Uh, because Zay Flowers, if you've seen him play, is one of the most dynamic wide receivers, and with Phil Dracovic getting him the ball, very tough, very tough. Talk to me a little bit about UMass's defense. You know, just in general, how are they looking? Are there any names to watch for, you know, either on the defensive line or in the secondary? Right. Well, the secondary is probably UMass's strength uh, on defense, so that'll be an interesting matchup with a kid like Flowers, who is, who, like you say, is, is one of the most talented players UMass is going to see this whole season. I would say that you know UMass's defense against Pittsburgh didn't exactly do what you would hope. They flashed. They had some moments where they were good. They caused a turnover or two, and and that's always good. But they were on the field way too much because UMass's offense couldn't control the clock. And you know, the longer you're on the field like that, the more and more worn down you're going to get. UMass's defense, their defensive line, uh, it may have been a game plan issue, but they didn't get any pressure on Kenny Pickett for Pittsburgh at all. They really only rushed three guys most of the game and kind of sat back in his zone, which was not uh, an ideal game plan, in my opinion, anyway. If if they're going to do anything against Boston College, they're going to need to send at least four guys against Dracovic and try to blitz, too. Otherwise, you know, and it, it might mean that they're going to have to leave their defensive backs in man coverage, but they need to create something, some sort of havoc. Otherwise, I think Dracovic and BC will just carve them up. Flowers is going to be going against probably Josh Wallace if he's healthy. He got dinged up at Pitt, but he looks like he's okay. You know, Wallace is UMass's best cover corner, so that's going to be an interesting matchup. He's only a sophomore, but it could be him. It could be Bryce Watts, who was a transfer from North Carolina, started his uh, career at Virginia Tech. He had a couple good plays against Pittsburgh as well. But, yeah, I would imagine that, you know, they'll probably – man up Josh Wallace on Flowers and then maybe try to bracket him over the top or something like that. But it's going to be very interesting to see what type of numbers Flowers puts up. I think he's probably going to have a, a fairly big day. You know, UMass's secondary is good, but Flowers is great. So it'll be tough to tough to stop him. Yeah, and I'm not going to get into the, the predictions for this game because, you know, it's a 40-point th- spread right now, a 38-point spread. So it is what it is. But looking at UMass's schedule, I've heard actually a lot of positivity about the program this year and looking at their schedule, it, other than, you know, they've got a couple tough games, but there's definitely some winnable games for UMass moving forward. You know, you get Eastern Michigan, Toledo, UConn's a complete disaster right now. Rhode Island, Maine, Army, New Mexico state. You could win. You could easily win five or six games there. Is are, are, are UMass fans thinking that maybe, 
you know, that that's a possibility, maybe bowling for for the for the Minuteman this year. A moment to talk about Built Bar. Built Bar has nine delicious flavors and occasional limited time flavors you have to check out. Whether you want coconut, coconut almond, cherry, raspberry, they have nine flavors and they're hundred percent covered in chocolate and they are so good. They don't have that gritty chalky feeling you get from other protein bars. You gotta try them. I have one every day in the afternoon. It gets me the energy I need to sustain me through my work day. Give me the energy to go home and take care of my kids. It's perfect. You got to check out Built Bar. They have 17 grams of protein, only 130 calories, 4 grams of sugar, and 4 net carbs. Again, head on over to BuiltBar.com, and if you use promo code LOCK15, you'll get 15% off your first order. Use promo code LOCK15 for 15% off at BuiltBar.com. I mean, I'm sure there's going to be some subset of UMass fans who think that that's an option. Uh, you know, the most optimistic of UMass fans, and you know, every fan base has them. I'm sure BC fans out there think they yeah. might win the title this year. You never know. But I would say the more logical down-to-earth UMass fans are probably only looking for three wins this year. I mean, that's the number I put on it when, when I've been previewing the season or talking on podcasts or anything like that. I've said three wins is really it. You've got two FCS teams which frankly you have to win those games. Uh, it, it's just really not an option for UMass at this stage of their FBS life of where they are as a program, all the, the pitfalls and everything they've had to deal with over the last decade. They, they can't be losing to Rhode Island or to Maine. And then you have UConn, which at this stage, you might have to put into the can't lose to them category either because they really are a disaster. I mean, everything that has happened in only the last 48 to 72 hours with Randy Edsel is just off the charts. Unbelievable what's going on down there. New Mexico State really has been struggling. Uh, I'm not sure what Eastern Michigan's going to look like uh, against UMass. They, they beat their FCS opponent fairly handily, but now they have to go play Wisconsin, I think, next weekend. So uh, there's definitely some chances to win, and that is very important for UMass as far as developing this program. They probably won't win them all. If they can win three of them, I think that's a good step for them this year. And then you're going to try to build towards 2022, where hopefully by that point, you're talking about maybe winning six, maybe being eligible, getting to a bowl if there's a, if there's a path there. That's probably the way it should go. But this year is more of a like win three games and, and be more competitive in the other games you play. That's kind of one of the more disappointing aspects of what happened against Pittsburgh last week. And unfortunately, what may happen against Boston College this coming weekend is they just weren't competitive and, and people really want to see them be more competitive. The last two seasons as part of this burn it down rebuild, they just have not been competitive in the games they've played. It's It's been a lot of very lopsided scores and you kind of hope that maybe they would be able to cover a, a similarly 38 point spread against Pitt. And I had predicted 42-14 for that one. There was a period of time where it was 44 to seven but 51 to seven and and it just it didn't look good for UMass that was a bit disappointing um you know we were probably looking at something similar for this game against Boston College this coming Saturday you're looking at something like that yeah just increasing the competitiveness is the way it has to be for UMass and and in turn that should lead to win about three games if they can do that I'd say that's a successful season at this stage and now I swear I'm not trying to troll here, Mike. My, my, this is an honest question because I, I, I like good football, and I remember when UMass was good as an FCS school under Don Brown. Do you think it would behoove them to go back down, or do you, are you happy with them being an independent? Uh, I, I mean, I wouldn't say I'm happy with them being an independent. If I'm going to speak as, you know, as an alum of UMass, as a fan of the program, being an independent is kind of a necessary evil, but – if that means staying in FBS, then that's what they have to do. Now, you know, we it, it's not uh, it's not for this pod, I'm sure, but there you there, there could be a lot of talk about what's going to happen as far as conference realignment goes. I was going to say the AAC, you know, they're yeah. they're dropping a bunch, and maybe they take you in uh, football only. Yeah, football only seems to be the path at this point. The AAC was uh, was something UMass would have probably moved all sports to maybe a few years ago when it still had UConn with Temple, everything like that. But the way it looks now. It would be a football only situation. They wouldn't want to leave the Atlantic 10. There's a lot, there's a lot of moving parts, and, and you hear this a lot with should they go back down, should they drop the program because of how much they've struggled. I don't think that's anything that they should do. I mean, staying <laughs> playing top level football is, is what they should do. You know, they are the flagship public institution in the Commonwealth, and playing D, D1 football. It means something. I mean, it, you know, there's only two D1 FBS schools in this state, UMass and Boston College, and and that's that's the sports highest level, and I don't think there's any problem playing at the sports highest level. It's just a question of being competitive at the sports highest level, and that's what they've struggled with. So I, I know a lot of people – what what people kind of long for is being competitive and winning CAA titles or A-10 titles or Yankee Conference titles, whatever it was when they were, you know, in school or, or fans when they were younger. 
I understand that completely, but the goal has to be to just win bowl games at the FBS level because there really is no point to being at the FCS level. I, I don't mean to insult teams that are, you know, people who are fans of FCS football or anything like that. I, I like watching FCS football, but for a school like UMass, they've made this move. This is where they are. You know, they've said many times they're not going away. They're not going down. So they just have to keep working to try to make this a success at the FBS level. And, and that's what they hopefully are trying to do here. We'll see. The jury's still out as to whether this coaching staff and program is going to work. If it doesn't, you just have to find the next guy and have him try to establish his program and make it work. That's, that's how it goes, in my opinion. All right, great. And I have two more quicker questions for you. Uh, Jake Bazico transferred to Boston College, and he was kind of, you know, BC landed a whole bunch of different recruits, both from the FCS and FBS level. And he was a name that really kind of went under the radar until the end of camp where Jeff Halfley talked about Bazico's going to get a chance to play this year. He was supposed to start or at least be on the two deep during the first game, uh, but he got hurt. Can you tell us a little bit about his time at, at uh, UMass? Give us, I mean, just even if you don't only know a little bit about him, can you talk a little bit about what he did for the Minutemen? Yeah, I mean, Jake Jake was a great player for UMass. I mean, he was he was a scholarship kid out here, obviously. He's walking on for his last year at Boston College. But he, he was a tough kid to block uh, coming off the edge. He did a good job pressuring, keeping contained when he could, getting to the quarterback. He works hard, tireless worker, and that's one of the, I think, probably the things that would endear him to BC fans, and Jeff Halfley in particular, is the kid has a motor. He just, he, he wants to play every down, and he plays as hard as he can. So, you know, in a room on a defensive line like Boston College has, I, you know, I, I don't want to say I'm surprised that Jake would be able to crack the two deeper play, because I know how hard he works, but you know, that's a very talented group of players that he's in there with now. But, you know, that's the type of kid he is. He may not have as much talent as they have. He, he's still got his fair share of it. But his work ethic is definitely going to make him a player that could contribute for BC this year without question. All right. And my final question is more of a fun one. I love I, I went to Amherst a couple years ago and went to the hangar and had some of the best wings I've ever had in my life. Um, what what's the what's what's your go to sauce or rub there? I, I am a cruising altitude guy. Always have been. Always will be. I mean, it's it's simple. It's basic. It's just the buffalo. But that's where I, you know, that's where I lived when I was in school. When I, whenever I go there now, I'm always cruising altitude. But you know, the wings at the hangar are world famous, and it's it's always fun to be able to go back out there. You know, whenever I go out to see games or anything like that, I'll you know, hitting a place like the hangar or another place in town like Antonio's or Buena Isano, like the food and and being back in Amherst is always a good time. All right, Michael Traney, thank you for coming on today. Where can people find you on social media? Uh, you can hit me my – there's at Michael Traney on Twitter, and then there's also at FightMA247 for the site itself. And, uh, you know, both of those accounts are me tweeting, so you can always check those out. Give them a follow if you want. And uh, we also have a Facebook page for the site, Fight Massachusetts on Facebook, if you're interested in following that. You know, click – give that a follow and a like. We always appreciate it. All right, Michael Traney, thank you for coming on, and uh, we'll talk again soon. Take care. All right. Thanks, AJ. Take care.